Thanks for listening to Uncle Sam's Soccer Podcast, keeping you up to date with the latest in American soccer. And don't forget to subscribe. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this edition of Uncle Sam's Soccer Podcast. I'm Stephen Jodderan here in Wisconsin. Down in Texas, Armand Kafai. Up in Minnesota is Jake Watroba. And we're going to continue our mini-series on the potential relocation of the Columbus crew. We're going to take a national perspective, give you our thoughts on what we mean by national perspective. We also have a show regular, COO of the New York Cosmos, Eric Stover. He'll be joining us to kind of give us his thoughts on the potential relocation of the Columbus crew, obviously working for MLS at one point. And then uh, lawyer Mickey Turner. I don't know if you've been following his stuff, but he's been giving his opinions on Twitter and on his website about all what's going on with the Austin City Council. So we'll have him on the show. But guys, lots of World Cup going on, MLS action, Soccered Out is taking a whole new level. I'm not Soccered Out yet, to be honest with you. I've watched four hours of soccer today, so there's just too much soccer on. I don't know what to do with all of it. I just want to watch it all. It's it's a a lot of work. I took up on Armand's... um, uh, kind of nap nap thing during uh, soccer games yesterday during uh, Uruguay Portugal so I think that restored my restored my interest in the World Cup now that I'm on like Armand's level we're on that save wave wavelength now <laughs> oh nap football nap, nap football. football you already know and today's nap football game is uh Vancouver Colorado so be on the lookout <laughs> <laughs> uh, just be on the lookout guys uh, take a nice nap during that game have it on Wake up in the 80th minutes, probably going one one or something like that. You haven't missed a thing, especially when it's <laughs> Colorado and, <laughs> and Vancouver. I mean, you could have said all, you could have said that said about uh, Denmark, uh, Croatia. Watch the first five minutes, a nap, and then wake up. It's 116th minute. Save a PK, goes into PKs, drama. Pretty good day. Pretty much caught everything you needed between that game. But no, let's talk about uh, Save the Crew and continue what we've been doing here. Jake and Armand, let, let's just pose the question. And listeners, follow us on Twitter, Unc Sam Soccer Pod, and let us know what you think. What does it mean if the crew were to get relocated? Whether that be Austin or Taylor Twelman's spitball of an idea of Sacramento. Jake, you want to take this first? I think what this means uh, nationally is if you are a supporter of a team that is a mid to small market club, your team can be taken from you if MLS decides and and, and PSV uh, decides that the crew are better suited to move to Austin. Um, Armand, what do you think? I agree. It does open up that bo- that Pandora's box of hey, if your team is struggling, you can always move them to another soccer viable okay, market. I, I, I think I'm that, sorry. I think that's the biggest thing. I'm sorry know? to interrupt, Armand and Jake, but I, I want to take this point a little further. What markets are we talking about relocation? Because there's some markets, even if they struggle, they're going to sit sit in that market just because MLS is not going to be able to re put a team there. It's kind of like. Well, they're screwed with it. For example, DC United. Now they've just opened up a brand new stadium, Wayne Rooney coming in. Even if that had not happened, would DC United get relocated? No, it's Washington, DC. You keep a team there. How about the New England Revolution? Crafts have been quite stingy on spending the money there. Yes, there's been talks with the stadium. Sometimes the attendance jumps up. There's interest when the team does well. When it's poor, not so much. But the likelihood of Boston losing an MLS team is unlikely. Yes, MLS would have the freedom to suddenly just dictate where you put clubs and relocate left and right. It also takes MLS to vote on it. So it's not like an owner could just, Dan Hunt could magically wake up and be like, I want to relocate FC Dallas. No. But serious, what markets would be able 
to relocate. Didn't Don Garber, wasn't it last year, kind of call out Montreal Impact fans for not supporting the club? Okay, so I Montreal Impact. Yeah, That's, yeah. That would be a I team think, that I could see moving, yes. I think you could even make a case for Colorado. Okay. I think you, you, can, you can make a, make a case for them. Um, it's if, a lot harder was, than you think. Real Salt Lake, do you think Real Salt Lake would get moved? Well, well, no, because Real Salt, Real Salt Lake's a, a, a fine team. I'm saying it not at the moment, but in the future, it, it creates this precedent that you know, if if it's everything is struggling, which is a possibility, we've seen the original team struggle very badly. That hey, you might just be like, all right, why don't I just do what uh, Precourt did and let's move the team to? I mean, let's say I'm just gonna throw out a name, Detroit, or uh, the crew of whatever, any team to Detroit, and they they, they can do that. It kind of opens up, uh, it sets a precedent for the future, and that's uh, a very interesting thing to do because it. I think it makes it makes MLS. It puts the uh, the famous uh, American sports uh, relocation staple on the league. Uh, I would agree. It does set a precedent, but I think it is more difficult than one thinks because there's not many teams that MLS would be able to relocate without there being a collapse to their structure with the markets. Cl- I mean, I, I, here's the. Th- Here's the thing. I know I said small to mid-market teams, but if a team like New England is not making money and they're not getting fans in the seats and no one's watching them on TV, I get that it's a big market. But at what point does MLS – I mean MLS could theoretically look at that and go, it's just not working in this market. But how many markets would they be able to move to? Isn't there so many – There's tons of market. Phoenix, Detroit, Sacramento – there's plenty of those teams that are, are going to miss out on expansion. They're always going to just, you know, be, Charlotte? Be, be, be there, be open. And if there's no opening of the pyramid, this is always going to be a possibility of a way to get into MLS, especially if they cap the league at, what, 28 teams, what they want. If they cap the league there, then there's no more spots left. So the only way you can get in would be through a relocation. I mean, I, I see your point, but I, I'm just playing devil's advocate. Because it, it is a little bit harder to once dig into and say, okay, would FC Dallas relocate? What about the Houston Dynamo? Well, I'm not, um, well again, it's not, it's not, it's not more of a now thing. It's more just like no, it, 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 I, it, I, in, in, in the future, it, like, it, yeah, it, it, it sets that precedent. That's the thing. Like now, okay, you probably don't see any. But how strong of a precedent move. is it? I, th- I think it's, I think it's pretty strong. That you know, if a, a, a team is struggling, that now they have this. An option to and, move, move a team, but the other what thing it too, the other thing too about this. Sorry to interrupt. Is Anthony Precourt has shown future owners a way to get out of a city too if it if it can't get an expansion side. Well, here's the thing: MLS could create its rules on its own and invent them and reinvent them whenever, whenever it suits them best. They could just plop it up. Here's the new rule: oh, the siding rule. Uh, 100.2 because they are a closed system because they're D1 for a lack of a better term that's it but wouldn't it make more sense if MLS was worried about how markets react to open up the pyramid because then you would you know I guess in a natural process lose the bad markets or make or force teams to invest Right, no, no one's and no one here is saying uh, or necessarily talking about promotion and relegation, right? Because for what we know, this is from what we know and what we've heard from the commissioner, that does not seem to be an option for the for the foreseeable time being. So we 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 can mention the hypothetical, but the reality of the situation is, are the the reality is we're in this closed system. At the moment, no, and right. The, the and the crew moving in, enables um, another owner who's saying, "Okay, I'm losing money in this area. This isn't that good, you know." Blah blah blah. To open up the way to move, and as Jake said, there's a blue, there's a blueprint printed out, mm-hmm. ready to go. And mm-hmm. this is how you get out, and this is how you 
you know, so that that's my thing. I mean, my thing is all about this precedent. Is is it a good precedent that we're sending? Or is no, it it's one? terrible. It's terrible because it's not a natural way to get rid of the bad markets when we know what how soccer naturally does it through the pyramid system. If MLS were smart, if they were so worried about the the poor quality regarding TV shares and marketing and blah blah blah, making money, open the system up then. You would get rid of the markets that are not interested in it. You would see the owner suddenly be flustered and then realize, okay, well, what are we going to do with the investment? The money or the dollar becomes more important. The onus is on the owner. Like the, the crew, the fans have been there from day one. The team's been successful. But it's pre-court who bought the team at such cheap price who hasn't really done much to reinvest. It's the owner's fault that some of these markets fail. I mean, are we blaming FC Dallas fans for not showing up for FC Dallas, or are we blaming the lack of marketing? I don't think anyone is, uh, like I said, like the fans shouldn't be blamed. Again, it's on the owner. I think that's the one thing that's been pretty cri- cri- crystal clear is we need you want an owner that's ready, ready to invest. But if an owner is seeing that you know they're not making money, um, or whatever. I'm just putting Precor's viewpoint out there. He's saying not making money, anything potential in another market. I mean, why not move? In that instance, what do you think, Jake? Uh, it's I don't know. I feel like you're you're towing you're towing a line. A, a dan- I don't know. I say dangerous line, but yes, it's on the owners to kind of put the team out there, like you said, like uh, Dallas. I think. You both have been on record on the show in the past saying Dallas has not marketed well. Yeah, it's, it's on the owners. It's on the owners. But in the same sense, though, too, if you're a fan of Columbus Crew and you're not going to the game, you know, and you're not watching the game, you're not buying merchandise, whatever, uh, I mean, these, these are the kind of things that are going to happen, though, eventually. That the team's not – I mean, it's it, in a sense, it's on the fans, too. If you're not supporting the club, then what what do you expect is going to happen? Well, yeah, so uh, – but They're not going to keep a team there that's drawing 5,000 people. Like, that's that's USL numbers. <laughs> and I know, I know they're not drawing 5,000 people. I know someone on Twitter is going to twist my words like they always do. <laughs> <laughs> no, but actually like, – My God, it's like every time I watch a Columbus Crew game, damn near half the stadium is empty. They couldn't even sell out a playoff game last year, man. Especially after the team announced we're thinking about relocating and they couldn't fill Map Free Stadium. Okay, so, Jake, you're, you're kind of getting to my point here with regarding the national perspective. And I think hashtag save the crew is the politically correct way of going about this. Yes, you're hashtag save the crew. We're all going to post it on Twitter. Who wave the... The flag, yes, we're with the crew. When I think majority of U.S. soccer and MLS fans really don't care. I don't. Because teams have been relocated across American sports. The Atlanta Thrashers to Winnipeg. The Seattle Supersonics to OKC. The Expos to Washington. The St. Louis Rams to L.A. The San Diego Chargers to L.A. The Raiders to Las Vegas. San Jose Earthquakes to Houston Dynamo. That's, you know, that has happened. Obviously, San Jose got a team eventually a couple years later. So, for people to come out and say, or people in Austin be like, yeah, well, we want an MLS team. Damn right. Like, come on, pre-court, bring the team here. They get branded as an anti ML, uh, you know, some sort of, I don't know what you want to call it, a little pre-courtist guy, su- you know, supporting the evil of MLS and Anthony pre-court. So I, I think we need to tone down the regnet and realize that a lot of people honestly don't care outside the crew. And we get tweeted all the time about how a ton of crew fans are going to not watch MLS if the crew were to leave. And if I were a cr- cr- crew supporter, I'd have a hard time watching MLS 2, 2 if the team left. But if we've learned anything from American sports, time will heal and you'll eventually watch an MLS match again. I mean, people in Seattle still watch the NBA. People in 
in uh, San Diego still watch the NFL. So th- there's a precedent set that American fans don't care. They flip the page real quick when it comes to sports. Hashtag me too, but then we're going to watch the, the NFL when you have domestic violent cases left and right. I mean, for God's sakes, we're going to watch women beaters out there. So sports fans in America are very hypocritical. And people need to realize that hashtag save the crew is politically correct. But honestly, majority of people don't care all that much. I, mean, I, I support Save the Crew. I mean, I know I probably came off my last comment that I'm all for them moving to Austin, but I'm for them staying. But in the same sense, though, too, it's the, the onus has got to be on the fans, too, to at least – and I get the ownership sucks. But you also have to – if you want your team to stay, you've you got to su- support it. It's – but I do agree with what you're saying, Stephen, in terms of uh, the Austin um, – uh, side of things when you do uh, so I will sometimes scroll through and someone from the pro Austin person will they'll say something they get automatically like you said just really just like chastised on Twitter and yeah ostracized it, chastised it, whatever it, it's term one, it it's is one, it's one of those things that when you look at it I mean this is probably our only way to get potential an MLS team and you know if that's, if that's how it is you're gonna they're gonna take it they're gonna try to support it and they're going to try their best to get the team at least over here. I, I, I don't see an issue with it. And who's save the crew? I mean, I think we all do here. I don't think we'll see a, a league lose one of its founding members. No, they, I mean, it um, sucks. But, but, but like you said, time does heal wounds. And I, I know this isn't like the best comparison because MLS was like a baby back then. But, I mean... It, for there was a time where MLS was in Florida and they contracted both the Miami Fusion and uh, the Tampa Bay Mutiny, and th- th- those two teams are dead now. Uh, there was what there was talks that now Tampa Bay wants a new uh, an MLS team, right? And now Miami is going back to MLS again. It's not the best. It's not the best comparison, but I th- I think it's to your point that you know time does heal. All wounds. Yeah, but, but I, I I take it a step. In this instance, in this in this instance, though, I want to say it's 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 a lot messier, and it's it's getting to the point to where it almost does look like Precourt is doing certain things on purpose to make sure the crew move. And this is where it's just it's it's getting messy, and I can see why crew fans do feel spited and why they would if I were end up just not watching it anymore. If I were a crew fan, if somebody who actually went to the games, I'd be pissed. I'd be a. I'd be pissed at Precourt, clearly. B. I'd be pissed at the league. C. I'd be, be pissed at all the crew fans that suddenly say they're crew fans that haven't been showing up to the games. Furthermore, I don't think people in or the MLS supporters in Seattle all much all that much care because at the end of the day, it comes down to okay, what are the Seattle Sounders doing? What about the fans in Atlanta? Do they really care all that much? Some do, but majority of them, you know, sucks, but there's nothing I can do. That's the mentality of a lot of MLS supporters have. That's my personal opinion, okay? I'm not saying that Anthony Crew pre-court's in the right. I'm not saying he's in the wrong. I'm just giving you a an analysis of what I see on Twitter. The hashtag Save the Crew movement has been spread like wildfire. But how many people actually believe in it? I think it's a lot smaller than they actually type it up because it's the correct thing to say. And if you come out saying, I really don't care about ha- hashtag save the crew, you're going to be chastised. You're going to be on Reddit and people are going to mock you endlessly. It sucks, but that's the reality of a closed system. And if you're a crew supporter, you should probably maybe open your eyes and go, maybe an open system's a better deal because then it shuts down owners from relocating and then it makes them invest into the club. And fans will show up because suddenly their team has something to play for. This is a silver lining for the league. If they want to talk about relocating and open this precedent up to, okay, uh, relocation here, there, woohoo, game show going on here with relocation, open up the system, take care of business like that. No, you're definitely right. This The relocation, this whole relocating the crew thing is going to light a fire under the pro-rel for USA uh, people, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, it does. 
it, you're it, right. It's, it's I mean, a silver lining. Because you're not wrong. I mean, it, it's like uh, um, MK Dons and AFC Wimbledon uh, in in England. I think that's the that's the one that's the best comparison to in the in the soccer world. Uh, Wimbledon lost their team, and they worked their way up through the English pyramid to get back, if not almost above uh, MK Dons. Uh, if if the pyramid was open, you could have a situation like that. But like I said, it's, it's the reality of the situation. So. What can what what can you do in this instance? I mean, it, it generally sucks, and you know you you have to really you have a hard, it's a hard ma- matter to look at because you have like if you're the owner, what do you, what do you do? You, I mean, if if you have a team that's losing money, it's your investment. And back to Jake's point, if you're a fan of the club, well, don't you have an obligation to support it? And then if you're gonna waive the well, we want to uh, talk about keeping the club here. Shouldn't you at least have been supporting it the previous years? It would be very hypocritical of me to say, oh, I want to keep FC Dallas in Dallas. But if I haven't been to many games, uh, it's very hard for me to stand on two legs and have an argument. Well, you haven't been supporting the club. If I have another buddy who barely goes to any games, he's like, oh, we should keep Dallas here. I'm like, dude, you don't even go to the games. It's not going to impact you. No, yeah, it's, I mean... People need to realize their actions have consequences. In MLS, pre-court, their actions have consequences. The fans of MLS, their actions have consequences. It's not somebody's fault over the other. I think they're equal parts, but it's it's a bad image look right now for MLS with what's going on with the crew because it's it nobody knows what's going to happen, and that's even worse when there's so much speculation. Anyway, up next, Eric Stover. Joining us right now is one of the show regulars. It's the COO of the New York Cosmo, Eric Stover. You can follow him on Twitter at Eric Stover, NYC. Eric, busy watching the World Cup, I'm assuming. <laughs> yeah, it's been a great tournament so far, other than my Germans getting knocked out. <laughs> <laughs> I just, so, it's, it's been an interesting tournament. All the big boys seem to uh, be crashing out. Yeah, I think, um, quite honestly, they've kind of deserved to go. Germany just... Uh, even though they maybe dominated possession in their games and could have gone through, they they just weren't themselves. Um, I thought Spain was hard done today. Um, I thought those were two penalties on that one cross. Um, But, you know, they weren't themselves either. So, you know, there's a lot of big names falling out, and you you don't really see that in the World Cup. It's only been won by a handful of countries, and there's normally a reason for that. No, yeah, Eric, uh, you talk about your Germans being knocked out. My uh, my Iran <laughs> was knocked out in a pretty heartbreaking way too. So uh, I I, to- I totally feel you on that. Um, Eric, we've been talking about save the crew and all that stuff. What are, what are just your general thoughts on the entire situation? Um, well, I, I think it's a, a mess and. You know, I haven't followed the legal side of it that closely in in Ohio with the Modell rule and what the ramifications are and what the likelihood of success is for Columbus, the city. Um, so I'm, I'm not, I'm definitely not an expert there. Uh, but you know, I'm not surprised that MLS and Anthony Precourt are so determined, despite the backlash to to move and to probably go to Austin even though it, it's not that it's not like Austin's opening uh opening themselves up with wide open arms and saying please come here and um take our money um so i think that side of it's still a mess too but um I, you know i've thought for a while that cincinnati was inevitable and that uh columbus was being run into the ground and that uh, MLS was never going to want to have two teams um, in that close proximity to each other with, 
you know, I think they're like the 32nd and 33rd or something like that um, uh, DMA sizes in the in the U.S. So you're you're sort of swapping one modest market for another, and they weren't going to want to have two modest markets. Um, and also, you know, we had at the Cosmos, we had a, a, a sales rep that worked for us that uh, worked for the crew, and he said back when he was there that, the, you know, they got a lot of sales out of Cincinnati. Um, and, and the fact that um, SC Cincinnati's done so well in recent years has inevitably hurt Columbus. Uh, so from a business point of view, it you know, I was fairly certain for the last couple of years that, that the crew were doomed. Eric, I, th- before you came on, we had a segment, and I, I kind of threw floated this idea out there that majority of U.S. soccer fans, I mean, it's the politically correct way of saying, yes, you stand with the crew, but generally don't really care if the crew get relocated. Do you get that sentiment, too, that majority of at least MLS fans outside of the Columbus crew will look at it and say it's a really bad situation and it sucks for the fans, but they have their team and, you know, kind of is what it is? Uh, yeah, I think I'd agree with that. I mean, it's hard to get an accurate sense on social media, media like Twitter mm-hmm. because I think the most vocal people that are mo- the most passionate about issues are on Twitter and they, they speak their mind, but they're not necessarily representative of, of the group as a whole. Uh, so I think soccer fans in general in the United States are kind of indifferent to it, whether they're used to franchise relocation because it's happened in other sports for years or um, you know they just don't care enough about MLS whatever it is I I don't think this is a an important cause for fans across the country and you know I've read a lot of uh, stuff out of people in San Antonio and you know they they've they, they've almost said you know they've sided with save the crew so they get a team even though san antonio was part of a a pretty sketchy exchange of leaving the nasl and going to the usl and really starting the 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 domino effect of problems for the nasl so i think you're right i think it it you know it comes down to you know whatever's good for me and my market and you know my fandom then that's what i'm going to support so yeah i don't i'm surprised that you know sort of to contradict myself for a minute here that i'm surprised at how difficult it's been um because you know the st louis rams moved to la rather quickly without much noise um but this seems to be different and i don't know if there's unique legal situations here or if things have been mismanaged or what but it's kind of hanging on much longer than I anticipated, but I do think they're going to go, and at some point that'll be official. Eric, uh, before we had you on in our opening segment, we we discussed the the precedent, what uh, the the precedent the crew could set for MLS if they relocate to Austin. Uh, what's what's your opinion on the, the precedent PSV? Uh, and or, or the crew could have by relocating uh, uh, the crew to Austin. Yeah, I'm not sure about the the precedent because you're talking about states' rights and whatever state laws there are, and if somehow Ohio is able to keep the team there. Um, by the way, I'm not sure they actually want to do that in the end. Uh, you know, back to the point of having two teams not far away and. Um, a jaded business community in Columbus now. Now again, I'm speaking out of turn. I don't I don't know what it's like on the ground there, um, but just trying to illustrate the point that each market, each state is different. Um, but I do think it uh, puts a spotlight on on a very real issue in that fans of club teams in this country, um, a lot of them have this romantic idea of it's actually a club and it means something to the community and certain organizations just don't see it that way it's a business and if they're going to get a better deal somewhere else they'll pick up and move um so this romantic idea of 
you know, the Columbus crew being about Columbus is is a sales pitch, and that sales pitch has run out, and they're looking to to move it to another location. And I don't think that's that's going to change in American sports uh, without fundamental change in how the game is governed here, particularly for soccer. And when you say that fundamental change, are you uh, talking about opening the system potentially? Yeah, I, I, I think that has to happen for communities to take greater control of, of their team. Mm. Um, and if you have the, the opportunity to go up and the risk of going down, uh, it's going to mean a, a whole lot to a community, sort of like college sports is driven on, on pride of the university um, and I, I think that has tremendous potential in this country. Um, it could help the sport grow regionally much stronger and then nationally to be more relevant as we're telling more interesting stories. Um, but if we stay in closed systems, the fan has very little to say about um, how these things unfold. Now, of course, you can get... Uh, community truly galvanized and you can have elected officials that are going to take this cause on and um, fight to the death over it. Um, it that that stuff can happen but to date at least off the top of my head I can't think of an example where it has happened where a team has stayed that has announced its intention to move unless of course it was a bluff like Robert Kraft and um, Boston, you know, about his stadium threatening to move to Providence, and it was always a bluff. But um, yeah, I think it, it again, it's a long way to winded way of saying I'm not sure it's about precedent. It it really just shows what situation fans are in. Let me ask you: during your time during MLS, were there talks of relocation? Even you know, maybe even your time with Red Bull, but were there whispers of other clubs? maybe relocating um well with the crew i wasn't with um red bull at the time but i i did know someone that made a bid to purchase the crew and his plan all along was to to move the team to a different market um and what he had told me was that there were two prices for the team one to keep it in columbus and one to move it um so I'm not surprised that there's a clause in free court's agreement that allows him to move it. Um, I do think it's interesting that it's Austin because it's it's not like for like every market is different, but as far as market size goes, it's it's similar in in size to Columbus. Um, and you know, MLS has been very vocal about wanting to get stronger nationally with television markets to try to improve their their television ratings which are pretty abysmal at this point and you know if mls is ever truly going to be an international threat top five league which it's far from right now um they need much much greater television ratings and and television revenue um so there was a lot of discussion on how to get into those those markets austin would not have been at the top of the list at the time. Eric, does it, when you were with uh, the Red Bull, did you ever get the impression that MLS has the ability to create its own rules on the fly? Uh, <laughs> that's a that's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> Especially asking me and what my job is right now yeah. with the Cosmos. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I expressed frustration in, at the time in, in certain things that would happen. Um, definitely, it's a, a centralized governance in that there are rules, and a lot of them are flexible. And um, if it's in uh, Garber's estimation that it's in the best interest of the league to break a rule, he's done that in the past. Um, you know, one incident that we had uh, when I was at Red Bull was uh, Claudio Reyna um, was injured, didn't um, want to go through what he needed to to try to rehab to get back on the field, felt his time was up, wanted to retire. Uh, we wanted to reinvest in 
um, a designated player uh, because, you know, in New York we felt it was essential to have designated players for relevance in New York. Um, and the league wouldn't allow us to replace him. Um, and that's the kind of thing that I think if Red Bull had more juice within the league office and had more representation on key committees, that, you know, that, that decision would have gone differently. Um, and I think I've been backed up by that since, you know, that season ended 2008. At the end of 2008, they passed a rule that you could do that. Um, but in real time, they didn't allow it. So, yeah, I mean, it's a single entity, technically one company, and if they think it's in their best interest to um, make a change on the fly, they've done that. And I don't think that's really a controversial statement. I think we've, there are countless examples of how that's happened over the years. Um, and then I also think they carry a lot of influence on U.S. soccer and, and pro league standards and and how the sport is governed here. Um, so there is a lot of, in my opinion, moving the goalposts. Eric, I just want to go back to when your previous responses, you mentioned how uh, Austin wasn't on top of uh, the list of potential uh, cities, you know, and you were surprised to see them, uh, you know, that they were going, that the crew would move to Austin. What, what were some of the teams that were atop that list at the time? Well, it wasn't relocation. Um, maybe as I talk, something will pop in, in my brain. It'll come back to me. But it was really about getting into markets that MLS wasn't in. Um, Atlanta was in that discussion. Uh, Miami. Uh, St. Louis was one that was always talked about because the, the perceived strength of the soccer market there and the history of soccer there. Um, let's see what else. Those are the ones that are that are jumping out to me. Um, and, you know, when I was there with Red Bull 2008 through 10 or 11, I can't remember, uh, 11, I think, that was the start of this aggressive expansion. Um, we got in Seattle and Portland. I mean, we were getting into a lot of very good markets. Uh, San Diego was one that um, – was often talked about but always lacked the local investor i think phoenix is a big market that mls had talked about um but uh was con concerned about the summer schedule and how hot it can be there um but yeah, to my recollection there wasn't much talk about moving teams it was really about making existing teams more relevant in their market and um, getting new partners in to expand the footprint. Now, I know you just talked about how to make existing teams more relevant. How does MLS take that into action? Because there are markets across MLS that suffer from just not having people show up, and there is a lot of criticism pointing at the front offices saying, where is the marketing? Yeah, you know, we've heard that a lot. Um, I've heard it at the Cosmos. I heard it at, at Red Bull. And I distinctly remember a Board of Governors meeting um, where we were going through budgets. And, I, you know, I'm representing Red Bull, but I'm just an employee. All the other people there are the owners of the teams. Um, and there was a discussion on relevance and marketing spend in individual markets, and Red Bull had by far the highest market spend um, on marketing and advertising, by far. And David Chekets was the principal owner of RSL at the time, and our budget was presented to the board, you know, the range. It was the highest marketing was like $3 million plus, and the lowest was a few hundred thousand in MLS at the time. And Chekets wanted to know who had – three million dollar budget and you know i had to speak up and talk about it and and for us at the time we were building a stadium we needed to make people aware of it we were signing designated players they needed to know who they were and that Thierry Henry was coming to new york um and you know check it to do better than anybody what it cost to to get a billboard in in new york city so um you know, there's a lot of criticism of front offices and marketing. I think that's an easy throwaway 
finger pointing thing that that people can do on social media and it it's it's not really relevant to the facts i think the the real issue when you look at soccer and markets that struggle um whether it's uh, red bull or dallas or chicago or wherever there's normally a uh, a local issue which can be location in the stadium and i think that's an issue for all three of the teams i just mentioned um so that's number one rule in business location 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 um and then the other thing is just the overall relevance of major league soccer in this country there's something like 80 90 million um declared soccer fans in the United States. It's a pretty high percentage of the 330 million people that live here. But only 10% of that 90 million follow MLS to any degree. So the soccer fans are there. They're just watching Liga MX or the Premier League or Champions League, and those numbers are backed up by the television ratings. Um, And so I think we've been in this chicken or the egg debate for a very long time in the United States, um, where either you're going to put up the money that you need to to bring in the best players in the world or Americans are not going to support it, generally speaking, across the board. You'll have success in markets like you've seen in Atlanta and, and Seattle and others, um, but I think the sport will always struggle um, until you bring those superstars in because that's what Americans are, are used to. They're mm-hmm. used to the best players in the world in whatever sport they're watching playing um, playing in their league, and that's just not the case in MLS. Well, Eric, unfortunately we don't have more time, and uh, we definitely have to have you back on the show to talk about the Cosmos and what's going on with them, obviously, with all that's going on with U.S. soccer. But uh, just let the listeners know where we can find you on Twitter and if there's anything else you wanted to add. No, well, always appreciate you guys giving me time. I enjoy talking about this stuff. Um, and if anybody wants to follow me, they can uh, find me on Twitter at Eric, E-R-I-K, Stover, N-Y-C. Um, yeah, and that's it. Fantastic, and uh, talk to you soon. All right, guys, thanks. Joining us right now is lawyer Mickey Turner. You can follow him on Twitter at Turner Esque. Mickey, how are you doing? I'm doing fantastic, guys. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, as I was saying in the little our little chat before him, and I'm down here at Starfire and Tuck Willa for C Zach Wani charity event. So uh, more soccer this uh, weekend for me. Yeah, it's already busy enough with MLS, World Cup, and then you covering what's going on with Austin and the potential of them getting the Columbus crew. Um, let's just begin and just get your overall thoughts on the entire situation as a whole. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a very broad question. Uh, yeah. And it's been, yeah, it's been pretty interesting to just kind of observe as an outsider. Um, although, you know, I do have an experience with a sports team leaving. Uh, the Sonics uh, left the NBA for Oklahoma City about, oh, God, it's been about 10 years. So, uh, you know, that's kind of part of the reason it piqued my interest uh, once uh, the crew announced that they were going to, uh, or try to move at least. Um, and then since then, it's just been kind of a, it's been a whirlwind as far as, you know, all of the legal stuff that's been happening and then the Austin stuff's been picking up and now they've got an agreement to to move that forward not the not the move itself but at least to negotiate so uh the uh i guess the overriding interesting thing to me is the model law uh mm. that is was put in place after the cleveland browns left uh to prevent teams who accept public money from relocating um you know i don't i don't think mls or anthony precourt the owner um anticipated or even knew about the law actually um and <laughs> so when this you know <laughs> because they announced the move in october of 2017 and then the first mention of it was i think december of 2017 when the uh, attorney general sent a letter out basically saying hey this is law in place so if you're going to try to move you need to do x y and z before we're going to let you you know take the crew out of here um 
And then they thought, you know, once uh, it was clear that Precourt and MLS weren't really going to, you know, cooperate, uh, that's when they filed the lawsuit. And then obviously that was in uh, April and it's been pretty crazy since. So uh, that's, you know, my overall thoughts are that the crew, uh, the Save the Crew thing has been uh, a thorn in MLS's side, I would say. Uh, I don't think, I don't, as I said, I don't think they anticipated the law, uh, and I don't think they anticipated the fan backlash, uh, not just from local crew fans, but from MLS fans generally and soccer fans generally. Um, because I just don't think that they thought that, and, you know, there would be some negative PR if they moved the team, but they didn't anticipate the backlash to this extent um, or the fight. So uh, they were probably caught off guard and have been catch, playing catch up, I think it's fair to say. Uh, ever since. Mickey, you mentioned the, the Seattle Sonics um, a few moments ago. What I want to ask you is, do you see any similarities with the events that led to the Sonics leaving Seattle and now the crew potentially leaving Columbus? Uh, quite a few, actually. And it's probably a story I, I will write at some point, maybe when we get closer to a trial or a resolution. But there are a lot of similarities. You have uh, in, the, in the Sonics case, an owner selling to an out-of-towner who was uh, quite nakedly wanting to move the team. Uh, and the crew in the situation, Lamar Hunt sells uh, to Anthony Precourt, who, and they, you know, he was obviously looking to potentially move the team because he inserted a clause that allowed him to move the team uh, to Austin. Um, and then you have stuff like, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the investment in the team as far as marketing and TV deals, Anthony Precourt's been accused of basically sandbagging that entire process, uh, not taking care of Matt Free Stadium, uh, and just not, you know, generally not investing in the team. Um, and that's that kind of what happened with the Sonics. They were terrible, basically, for about the four or five years, uh, yeah, about, yeah, four or five years prior to move actually happening. And then ultimately the attendance really suffered in those last couple of years. And then the crew, while they haven't been bad on the field, in fact, they've been quite good, uh, the lack of investment in marketing, as well as the announcement that they're trying to move, has really taken a toll. So I absolutely see a number of uh, similarities. And the other thing is that the uh, city of Seattle sued uh, uh, I, Clay Bennett, who, ended up, who owns, the, owns Oklahoma City now, sued them to keep them from breaking the lease. And ultimately, uh, Clay Bennett paid a boatload of money to the city of Seattle to be able to break the lease. Um, so, yeah, there are a number of similarities. And it's definitely something I'm going to look into in the future in, in reviewing that case. Absolutely, Mickey. And let's jump back to last week. From a legal perspective, what were the important events that transpired last uh, with the Austin City Council? Yeah, so uh, you know, there's, you know, I stayed up yeah, all night uh, basically watching that uh, that city council. It meeting. went late, uh, right? I, like three a.m., right? Yeah, it, it went to one. I want to say one thirty a.m. my time. Uh, so yeah, I think it was like about three thirty central, uh, and they started at ten a.m. central time. So it was you know eighteen hours ish uh, of them. You know, and most of it wasn't didn't have anything to do with the. Uh, with the move, most of it was, you know, your standard, uh, you know, your standard, uh, you know, city council stuff, bonds and, you know, uh, stuff like that. But uh, so around 11 o'clock, they finally got to this, uh, the Austin uh, PSV to uh, um, uh, Austin stuff. And it was pretty clear to me that they were going to vote uh, to approve them going forward with, uh, with negotiations. The thing really was that there were a couple of council members who, did not want to just hand uh, pre-court, uh, you know, his deal as is. And there were a number of council members who wanted other proposals to come into play. And that's where, you know, there were two basic, there were two resolutions up for, up for vote. Uh, one was number 60, which authorized the city to uh, negotiate with other developers or accept proposals from other developers to develop the site which is McCalla, which is where Precourt wants to put the stadium. And then there was uh, number 130, which directly authorized uh, 
the city to negotiate with uh, pre-court exclusively. So both of those passed. Uh, pre-court was not happy with number 60 passing because it does allow, obviously, potentially other developers to come in and, and grab the site from out from under him. Uh, and the in, the main interesting thing I took away from that, because I thought the vote was pretty much preordained, is that uh, their lobby has announced that pre-court has already blown through an MLS deadline to get this deal done. Uh, I don't know when that deadline is, but it was obviously before uh, the hearing. And so they have, they're working on an extension. So there's a date by which they have to get this done. I'd be curious to know what the consequences of not getting a deal done, because I doubt they are ever going to let the court step foot in, the, in Columbus again, uh, if they can help it. So, uh, so my, I, you know, my, I would infer from that, that MLS, if, if pre court is not able to get this deal done, they're going to take steps to have him removed. That's just my speculation. Uh, but there's, I don't see any way that the pre-court could ever come back to Columbus as the owner of the crew. So um, that's kind of the – that was one of the big takeaways I took away from that. The other one is obviously that they are starting to negotiate with pre-court formally to get a deal done to bring the crew to Austin. Do you think Austin wants this team? Uh Based on what I uh, based on what I observed at the uh, city council hearing, I think they would like to have a team if it is on their terms. Mm-hmm. Uh, and th- I, yeah, I don't think there's a there's not one one of them who will oppose this just because they do not want a team um, under any circumstances. There are a few who don't want a team based on the offer that pre court made. I think there's a few that would agree to take pre court's offer, um, but uh, aren't going to say that now because why you know ruin your leverage and often has a lot of leverage in this situation because they know that pre-court has wants to move they know that there's a deadline obviously in place and they know that if pre-court doesn't get this done he's likely out as an owner um so they have a ton of leverage so there was no reason for them to accept uh what uh, pre-court has to offer so they might as well sweeten the deal uh or get the deal sweetened and I would like to get to what happened in uh, Cincinnati. Um, Cincinnati uh, ended up getting a great deal from, uh, you know, FCC to get the expansion team because they knew that MLS really wanted the, the site. So that meant they got, they're paying full property taxes. They got a bunch of community benefits. So I, I expect the same thing could potentially happen here where pre-court doesn't get nearly the sweetheart deal that he was hoping for. And certainly not anything that was uh, certainly not anything near his proposal in the uh, uh, when he sent out his uh, his proposal to uh, build a stadium there. So, you know, one of the things is that he agrees to lease the property for one dollar a year for the next 20 years and then can renew it like three times or something like that. So it's just stuff like that. I don't think it's going to fly. Um, but, uh, yeah, so uh, I think often wants a team or would like a team if it's on their terms, which is a good place to be when the other party is, is desperate to move. <laughs> and Mickey, you mentioned the model law that's in place in the ongoing litigation between uh, the, the, two, the two parties, uh, Ohio and um, uh, P- PSV. What is, uh, what are the chances of that uh, going in favor of uh, Ohio and What's the, what's the basic gist of it from a legal perspective? Uh, okay, so uh, I'll, let's start with uh, the, what the, what's going on or what, or what the law uh, purports to do. It basically says any uh, organization that accepts public funds in the sporting context uh, uh, has to, if they decide they're not going to play at the stadium uh, that receives the public assistance, um, they have to give notice that they're not going to play there and give at least six months notice. And during that six months, they have to give local interest or the local government, uh, which is kind of a little uh, noted portion of that law, uh, but either the government or local business interest, the opportunity to purchase uh, the team. Uh, there, you know, the law is, is somewhat vaguely written, but that does, that's not a fatal flaw. Um, I think if they had it to do over again, they would you know, include some more stuff. Uh, as far as uh, specifics on what does opportunity to purchase a team uh, mean? It doesn't mean fair market value. 
taxes. I mean, what you purchase it for, plus uh, interest, stuff like that. They might include that stuff. But that, again, that does not by any means uh, that's not by any means fatal to the law. So uh, that's basically what they have to. Uh, the law says you have to do. Um, MLS is obviously contesting that uh, such a law is unconstitutional for about uh, 15 different reasons. Um, and so that's kind of that's at where we are. MLS has filed a motion to dismiss based on the fact that the law is unconstitutional in their eyes. Uh, and the city and the state have filed a response. We are actually waiting for MLS to file their uh, reply. So then the case is basically ready to be argued. Uh, for those of uh, you and your listeners who may not know, it's basically the, whoever moves to, who makes the motion, they file first, the other party files a response to the motion, and then the party gets, uh, uh, the party who filed the motion gets to reply, so they get the last word, basically. So we're waiting for MLS and PSV to file their last word on the motion to dismiss. Um, I'm actually working on a story on that uh, as we, well, not as we speak, but uh, earlier today, uh, that uh, MLS is trying to get an extension on that reply. They want to wait uh, about 90 days to have to file it, uh, which isn't which isn't going to fly. Uh, and they've they've like I said, I, I've gotten a copy of the motion. And I haven't uh, been able to finish writing it up yet. So there's a little teaser for you. There'll be a story coming out uh, probably tomorrow on that. Um, and so that's kind of where we are on the on the on the Model Law phase. Like once they file a reply, then the, the court judge can make a ruling on the motion to dismiss the case. If the judge rules in MLS and PSV's favor then you know, the case goes away because it, it'll be dismissed. Uh, you're subject to appeals and stuff. But uh, that's kind of where we are on the procedural side. And then the next step in kind of the trial side is we're waiting to see if uh, there are local buyers who are, in fact, uh, available to or willing to purchase a team. And they're trying to figure out what the team is worth and what a price would be that would be reasonable for MLS and PSV to accept to sell the team. Um, and so that's kind of where we are. And there's uh, apparently it's been some non-disclosure agreements that have been signed by the parties uh, that are in negotiation. So that's where we are uh, procedurally and as far as the uh, kind of the substance of the matters. Nikki, do you get any inklings that it's trending in that direction in this case, that they, they may be, I don't know if forced is the right word, to look for uh, a local investor in Columbus to purchase the crew? Um, I think we, like I said, the problem is we don't know what is going on behind the scenes as far as those negotiations are concerned. Because again, if there's no local investor who's willing to pay a reasonable price, whatever that ends up being, to purchase the team, then this whole thing is moot. Because, you know, if there's no one, and no one wants to buy the team, then there's no point in them being able to, then forcing pre-court to stay there. Um, so if, assuming that there are local buyers, um, at that point, uh, the judge would have a decision to make. If there is someone who's there and says, hey, I'm willing to buy the crew for $115 million and I have a deal with the city to get a stadium built, then at that point, the judge is going to have to make a decision and say, okay, uh, and if pre-court doesn't want to accept it, uh, then the judge is going to have to say, all right, well, here's an offer to buy the team, to keep the team here, pre-court MLS, uh, sell it to this guy, and pre-court gets his money and he can go away. At which point MLS is going to say, this is unconstitutional, you can't force us to sell a team, and then that's when it probably gets uh, you know, filed as a federal case uh, because you're dealing with you know, constitutional issues. So um, at this point, we're still not at the point where the judge has made a decision on that because, again, we don't know if there's been any local buyers who have made any, uh, any offers. But at this point, PSV and MLS are basically O for all of their motions. Uh, the city and state have basically won at every step along the way so far. Uh, so if that, you know, with that in mind, you maybe they see the writing on the wall and basically look to try to settle because they see that they're just not going to get any. They're not, you know, whether it's home field advantage or that they're not, they don't have a legal leg to stand on or their motions are poorly written, which is kind of my opinion. Uh, you know, maybe at some point they see that we're just not going to win here. And so it's better to cut our losses. But, uh, you know, without knowing, you know, without knowing if there's any actual potential buyers who are, have legitimate offers to make, it's difficult to say whether the judge is going to allow them to, to, uh, you know, to, 
force them to move. Mickey, one last question. What do you think this precedent sets nationally for MLS with all what's going on with the crew, PSV, and the local city councils? Yeah, I mean, obviously, if this if this law is upheld, you see a lot of uh, other municipalities starting to uh, write laws like this uh, to keep sports and um, you know to keep sports teams that accept public money in town. Obviously, if you're a private business and you build your own place and it doesn't work out, you can move, and uh, no one's going to be able to stop you. But uh, you could absolutely see a number of copycat laws um, in place going to place uh, if this is upheld, which is obviously why MLS is going to fight it tooth and nail. Because they don't, you know, MLS is probably going to be expanding still, and they want local help to get those things built. And other uh, sports organizations don't want these laws to go into place either. So you can imagine that there's some, uh, you know, pressure from the NFL, Major League Baseball, and uh, uh, NBA to keep this law from going on the books. So. There's definitely national implications about uh, if this law is upheld, which is why it's and one reason why it's difficult to see how this settles, uh, because a settlement is going to leave this law on the books. Uh, and I doubt MLS wants that, and I doubt any of the other sports organizations want that. Well, Mickey, thank you so much for joining us today because you provide a perspective that I think is pretty hard to find. Uh, elsewhere on, on on the pod we have a shameless plug where you can plug away where you can find uh, all your work and uh, your, you can mention your social media again so go ahead and just plug it all away all right uh thanks you can find me on twitter at turner esu uh p-u-r-n-a-r-e-s-u um and then you can find my writing at soccer esu uh similar spelling s-o-c-c-e-r-e-s-q um dot com and yeah that's uh those are my main social media uh outlets Awesome, Mickey. Thanks again, and we look uh, forward to reading your stuff. All right. Thanks for having me on, guys. Well, boys... Some interesting perspectives. And uh, Armand, you had texted me that that was a perspective you had never thought about with local municipalities making or implementing laws to keep their sports teams. Yeah, so I mean, it makes it makes this whole thing pretty big, right? Yeah. That like other major sports teams such as potentially the NFL, MLB, NBA are kind of like watching this like low-key because they're all, they're all, um, there, there's no promotion or relegation, obviously, within those sports. So if something like this happens, and you know that the, the, that Columbus wins, what, what, what is that stopping other teams from doing that, or other cities, excuse me, from doing that? And if you're a league, you're probably like, we don't want this. We we don't want this because that hurts us a lot. I'm telling you, the silver lining is if the crew relocate and even if the crew lose, more so if the crew lose, the promotion relegation aspect of U.S. soccer will be inflamed and it's just more fuel for that fire. It's a, it's a stupid, hilarious silver lining for MLS because MLS is so against opening the system. Yeah, I mean, you're totally right, Stephen. This is going to definitely uh, ruffle some feathers within the pro-rel for USA people. Uh, so that'll, that'll be exciting, I guess. We can have those <laughs> arguments again. Just like we had earlier in the winter, or the fall, when uh, the U.S. bombed out of the World Cup, or didn't qualify for the World Cup. So we get to kind of live that again. Oh, you're so right. So that'll be fun. I'm, I... no, that'll, that'll, be, that'll be lots of fun. The dragging out, I think, I don't know where it's going. It's so hard to tell if it's good for pre-court or if it's bad. I mean, Mickey said that pre-court already missed the deadline for well, within MLS, right? Yeah, but Stover also said MLS tries to write its own rules, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I don't, I, I don't think it really matters what the deadline is. No, you're What's right. Good for MLS, good for MLS, but. Is it the ideas that have the crew play in Austin starting next season? 
Right. That yeah, it is. You would think that. Yeah, and I, I, if this gets figured out in September, I don't think the the leagues and go, oh, you missed the deadline. You got to stay in Columbus for one more year, even though it sounds like the league has been entertaining the idea of leaving Columbus for quite some time now. So I don't think that a yeah, missed what, deadline is going to stop the group what happens like in Austin if, next year. Well, no, what I'm my saying is, what happens if this gets dragged out just through the legal issues, right? Just drags out to the point where. You have players and you have coaches who have no idea what's going to happen. They need homes. So if you can't just relocate for three months before the season starts, just so many stuff. So stu- I'm, 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 I'm going to throw it. I'm going to throw in a what if. What if this move gets delayed until 2020? That's what I'm thinking it's going to be. Get the stadium to start. I, I don't know if they could build a stadium in one year. Uh, it's with all of what's going on with – the city council, but it's to me, I wouldn't be surprised if we hear that Columbus Crew say next year season. I mean, think about it, right? Because um, we talked about the distribution of uh, the, the uh, conferences that would have to change if Columbus were to move to Austin. You'd, like we said, we'd probably see Minnesota move. Anyway, listeners, follow us on Twitter, Unc Sam Soccer Pod. Direct all your hate towards Jake Watrova. All your love to Steven Jodderand and uh, your hot takes to Armand Kafai. I love hot takes. There you go. <laughs> I love uh, follow our guests. Way- check out their uh, check out Mickey's work. Follow Eric Stover. He's always got interesting takes on U.S. soccer. Armand, were you going to add something there? Yeah. Um, uh, my uh, my hot sports take: uh, the the Lakers aren't going to the finals this year. There you go. We're, there you we're go. Gonna, we're gonna add, we're adding a little NBA wrinkle into this. Completely irrelevant. Follow, follow to, the NBA wrinkle too. Yeah, completely irrelevant to what's going on with the Columbus crew. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we'll have a fourth installment in our mini series regarding the Save the Crew in a couple of weeks when more news breaks. We'll continue this out until a solution is completed. Uh, until next time, take care.